Unclear. Unclear at this moment in time. Hi everyone, my name is Brittany from Brittany Loves Reading and today we are starting another themed vlog. This is part two of a vlog that I did a couple of weeks ago where I decided to count through titles on my shelves. I've been noticing that I have a lot of books with numbers in the title and in the first video, which I will link somewhere up here, I did the numbers one, two, and three. So in this video, we will be reading numbers four, five, and six. And for number four, I am picking up a book club book that I actually didn't complete. A few months ago, B&K Book Club was supposed to read The Four Winds by Kristen Hanna. I was supposed to read it. My life went crazy that week. It was insane. And I did not read the book club pick. Luckily, Kelsey held it down and ran the book club without me for a month. But I still need to read this and I want to still participate in the discussions because we keep them up on the Discord for a couple of months. So before we delete it, I want to read this book. So that's what I will be reading for number four in this vlog. I will be reading The Four Winds by Kristen Hanna. This is a historical fiction book by Kristen Hanna. I have read both Kristen Hanna's historical fiction before and contemporary fiction. I like both, but I have five starred every single one of Kristen Hanna's historical fictions. The contemporary doesn't always come out as high, but Kristen Hanna writes historical fiction so, so well. This is set in Texas following World War I and into 1930s during the Great Depression. It follows Elsa. Elsa following the First World War is considered very old to not have been married. At this time, people were marrying fairly young and she is kind of considered a spinster, but then she meets Rafe. Rafe and her get married and start a farm and start a family. Fast forward to now, it is the Great Depression and they are struggling. Their farm is struggling, their farm is dying, their marriage is on the rocks, and Elsa is trying to keep her children alive. We follow this family through this process of trying to either revive their farm and figure out what they're going to do during the Great Depression in Texas, or will they move to California and see if life will be better there. That is my impression from the synopsis of this book. I cannot wait to read this. I am prepared to cry because Kelsey told me that I am going to cry, so I am prepared. This is gonna make me cry. I cry at books. I've been, I've been forewarned. I'm ready to have a good book cry. I am actually feeling in the right headspace for that. I actually feel like that might be something that I want. Like sometimes I just wanna be devastated by a book and I feel like this is the time to do it. So it's the perfect time to be picking up The Four Winds by Kristen Hanna. I'm gonna go read this. It's gonna take me a little while. She's a bit chunky, but I will come back and chat with you as I go along. So I have finished The Four Winds by Kristen Hanna. This was a really poignant, an interesting look into the years following World War I and also into the early years of the Great Depression. We start off in 1921 and Elsa is 25 years old. She is living with her parents. She is considered ugly by her parents' standards. They're constantly telling her that she is basically too ugly to be married off. And now that she's 25, she's considered a spinster. Elsa is 25. She wants to explore the world. She wants to know what the world has to offer. She lives in a very small town in Texas, but starts to sneak out to kind of see what is out there and to push the boundaries of what her parents say is possible. While she's doing this, she meets Rafe. Elsa ends up becoming pregnant and her parents disown her. They pack her up in the truck and basically just drop her at Rafe and his parents' doorstep and leave her there. This was a time where pretty much all the family lived together. And even once Rafe and Elsa are married, which they do get married because of this pregnancy, they live with Rafe's family. Rafe is 18 years old. He's about to go off to college, but now Elsa is pregnant. So they get married and they move into his childhood home with his parents. Fast forward to 1931. Elsa is now living with her two children and Rafe and Rafe's two parents on their farm. And Texas is in the middle of the worst drought it has ever seen. The land is not farmable any longer. There is constant dust and there is no water. 
we see Elsa going through this horrible drought with her family and fighting to keep her family safe from disease, starvation, and horrific dust storms that are happening where even children have to wear like gas masks. It gets to the point where Texas is not safe for Elsa and her family and her children. So she packs them up to go to California because she has been hearing from everyone that California is this beautiful land. It has farmable land and also there are tons of jobs. But when Elsa arrives in California, it is not the California she was told it would be. There is a lot of people looking down upon the people coming into California. They're very concerned that these people are going to steal their jobs and it is not a good situation for Elsa and her children. This book is somewhat told from two perspectives. We see it from Elsa's perspective for a lot of it, but also a lot of the book is her daughter's perspective, Loretta. Loretta is only 12 years old, up to I think about 15 by the end of the book. She is a teenager, a full on teenager who thinks her mother is wrong about everything and somewhat blames her mother for not leaving Texas sooner and things of that nature. But truthfully, at the heart of this story, it is about the mother-daughter bond between Elsa and Loretta. I loved watching both 25-year-old Elsa and now 40-year-old Elsa come into her own. Elsa is a really different person from that young Elsa we see at the beginning of the book. And we see her come into her strength and her bravery through going through these hardships with her family. If I had to give a critique of this book, and it was only a really small thing for me, around the 60% mark, I felt this dragged a little bit and became just slightly repetitive at times. Again, that is a very, very small critique. This book is really a wonderful book and a great historical fiction and a really interesting look into this time in history. But if I had to give a teeny tiny critique, I did feel that around that point until it picked up again with some look into workers' rights in California. As always, I really do feel like historical fiction is where Kristen Hanna just absolutely shines. All that being said, I ended up giving this four stars and I cannot wait to read the next historical fiction by Kristen Hanna. But for this vlog, we are going to move on to a different book and a different author and a different number. So obviously this was the number four, so now I need to read the number five. And for that, I will be reading Five Little Indians by Michelle Good. Michelle Good is an indigenous Canadian author who has decided to write a fictional story. Basically, it's historical fiction because it is based on actual events that happened in residential schools in Canada. This is going to be a really hard read because, as we know, horrific, horrific things happened in residential schools. This book follows five children who are now teenagers and are leaving a residential school. They were taken from their homes as children and placed in these residential schools and now are being released into the world with no skills, no family, and no help. And we follow them working through their trauma as well as trying to figure out what life is like now that they're in Vancouver. That is really all I know about it at this moment but I'm really intrigued to hear the author's take on this very hard hitting topic. Five Little Indians by Michelle Good. This was such a powerful story. I'm going to give it four stars and I'm going to explain why I didn't give it five because it was very close. It's very close to a five star. And the only reason I knocked it down just a little bit was the writing style of the book. It wasn't told in a linear fashion and we very much jumped through time and also through following these children in a way that made it hard for me to completely follow exactly what was going on from chapter to chapter. It was the only thing that I didn't quite love about this book, but other than that, it is a fabulous read. Definitely a hard read. It covers some really hard topics, but I think it's an important read because we need to know about this point in history and what the 
peoples of Canada went through in regards to residential schools. That being said, this follows five different students who escaped or were released from residential schools. They all were in the same residential school, but all escaped or were released at a different time and are definitely survivors of this horrific, horrific place. We see at first Kenny, who is one of the boys who escapes from the school. He constantly is trying to escape due to the abuse that he is suffering at this school and eventually does successfully escape and get back to his family. We follow Lucy who ages out of the program and is basically released into Vancouver with no money, no idea what she's supposed to do, no family and no help. We also follow Howie who also escapes from this institution similar to the way Kenny escaped. We actually find out that Kenny helped Howie escape and we follow two other girls who were also released at various times, Clara and Maisie. We see them as they go through their lives, like I said, not necessarily in a linear fashion. We follow them right as they first leave, some of them, some of them we don't meet for years after they've left. And sometimes between a Lucy chapter and another Lucy chapter, 10, 15, 20 years would have passed. So a lot would have happened in their lives between moments of seeing into it. It was almost like snapshots of their lives, which was beautiful, but I kind of would have preferred a bit of more of a linear story. And that's the only reason this didn't get five stars. It is a powerful read. And I still think everyone would benefit from reading this and learning more about what happened to indigenous people at residential schools. Like I said, it is a hard read because of what happened, but it is the truth of what happened. And Michelle Good shines a fabulous light on this topic and what the church did, what the schools did, what the government did. And I can't go into all the details of this book because I want you to read it and take in the information that is in these five fictional stories from the book itself. That being said, I've actually already started the next book for this video because I need to read a book with the number six in the title and I have chosen The Atlas Six by Olivia Blake. This is the B&K book club book for this month and we started it on Wednesday. It's now Thursday, so I've already read a little bit of this already and so far I'm having a great time with it. I'm having a great time. This follows six magical people who are now being drafted into the Alexandrian society. Every 10 years, six new members are drafted into the society. And for a year, they study, they learn, and eventually one of them gets kicked out. To be honest, from the synopsis, it sounds like a fight to the death. So I don't know if the person gets kicked out or is murdered. I'm unclear. Unclear at this moment in time. But that is what we are following. The magic system in here is very, very cool. It's probably my favorite part of the book so far from what I've read. And I'm just 66 pages in, so I still am just learning about the magic system, but I'm really enjoying what I've seen so far. We're gonna be reading this over the next five days, so it's gonna be a minute before I come back and check in with you because of how we do the B&K Book Club books. We break them down into five day chunks. And these five days will be over Smut Den. So I will be vlogging for Smut Den while also reading the Atlas Six, but I will come in and check in with you potentially as I go, but I'm assuming just when I'm done the book, especially where I'll be vlogging all weekend for Smut Den. So I finished the Atlas Six by Olivia Blake. I had a really great time with this. I ended up giving it four stars and really enjoyed my time with it. This is a very character focused book. There is a bit of plot, but it's definitely more focused on the characters, the six people Atlas picks to try out for the Alexandrian Society, as well as Atlas himself and Dalton, who is like Atlas's assistant. In this book, we meet all six of the Medeans who are trying out for a spot in the Alexandrian Society. And we watch as they enter the society and start learning about their magic from basically ancient tomes in this library. They learn about how to use their magic and how to use their magic together in order to make their magic stronger. 
In this group of six, we have two physicists who basically can manipulate matter, fire, water, gravity, everything like that. We have a naturalist who has influence over plants and basically can even speak to plants, which was very interesting. A telepath, an empath, and a person who can see through magic and see illusions. That was by far my favorite part of this book. And I think the strongest part of this book was the character work, but also the magic system. The magic system in this book is so intricate and so unique. And I really enjoyed learning what each person could do and what they could do together and what was deemed kind of like a better magic to have or what was even deemed somewhat too dangerous for someone to have. Eventually, the six people that are trying to get into the Alexandrian society realize that by picking one person not to join, it actually means it is a fight to the death and someone has to die. And that is where the plot picks up a little bit. This book leaves on a bit of a cliffhanger. There is definitely not a resolution to this story, so I need to be picking up the Atlas Paradox very, very soon. I will say my favorite characters were Nico and Gideon. Gideon is Nico's best friend and he is half satyr, half mermaid. And Gideon is very much a side character in this book, but like a pretty main side character. We learn a lot about Gideon just because he's a big part of Nico's life. They have not started a relationship yet, but I am praying that I see a Nico Gideon relationship in the Atlas Paradox. I need Nico and Gideon in my life. Like I, I need this. I need this. One thing that I found really funny in this book though was that I'm from Nova Scotia and there's actually a few moments in this book where the author kind of used people who live in Nova Scotia and Nova Scotia as like the evil people of this realm. I think it's because Gideon's mother who is a mermaid and is technically a villain is like based off the coast of Nova Scotia. But there were so many times where I would read lines like blood sucking Nova Scotian leeches and I would just start laughing because I'm like, excuse me, how rude. Obviously it made sense for the book, but it had me laughing every single time. And I kept messaging Kelsey and I was like, are we mean? Like are Nova Scotians mean? I thought we were nice. And, and if the author has come here and we were rude to you, I'm so sorry. Like please come back. We're very nice. Anyway, that is the last book for this Counting Through Titles vlog. We ended up with three four-star books, so it was a pretty solid vlog. Very happy with how it went. Thank you so much for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.